you know, one of the things that struck me about the film is how the purity of the film uh, mimics the purity of the music. John Schofield is a uh, world-renowned jazz guitarist uh, and happens to be my neighbor. And we bump into each other often walking our dogs and we pick up conversations that I uh, fully enjoy and think could be podcasts in and of their own sense, whether we're... (laughs) <laughs> Whether we're talking about Keith Richards, you know, collection of, of special amplifiers from a certain date in the 50s or whatever it may be, it's it's a very uh, engaging conversation. And in one of those conversations, uh, John mentioned that uh, a film a documentary uh, was coming out that he uh, was the subject of. And I was immediately curious about that. So I said, John, I would love to see that. Um, so I, uh, went to your, uh, site, Jurg, and found, uh, the, the film and I got the film and I watched the film and I thought it was a great film. And after watching this film, I thought more people should see this film. One, two, one, two, three. That's my old neighborhood. hub of the music scene. If you don't mind, your tell us how this film came to be in your mind. Where did this come from? Well, as a filmmaker, I'm heavily influenced by music and jazz was always like one of my favorite genres and I thought maybe I should give it a try and ask John. And uh, so I wrote him an email and um, just contacted him and yeah from there it kind of moved on so okay so john you get an email from someone from you know, yeah you're, I, you're I, want, I want to make a documentary about you how did you receive that well um i thought yeah sure nobody ever asked to make a documentary movie and you're <laughs> um you're asked me and and actually i think you're i think you sent me maybe a link to um the desert rock uh video uh a a, 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 a movie that Jurg had made it's a fantastic movie um about the bands playing in the desert in california that started a whole thing and and i really enjoyed that <laughs> I knew from seeing that that this very interesting uh, artistic and uh, 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 talented filmmaker wants to do this. So I thought, yeah, absolutely. And was there any uh, trepidation at all about um, the the requirements of having the camera around so much? Did you uh, well, patience? yeah, I guess it probably was. I mean, it's it's not natural for us. But uh, I thought, what the hell, you know? And uh, and then you came, and and you're again his one camera, you know. So it's not like uh, mm. even when we've done television shows in Europe for, you know, where they film a jazz festival and there's five camera shoot, nothing like that. So it was actually uh, not intrusive. <laughs> On the one hand, you're very flexible with your handheld camera and you can run around the venue and choose different angles, but then you only have this one shot you can work with and normally you have like two or three. You really have to improvise and find a way to make it work. But I think it helps to morph uh, yourself into an almost neutral element when you're just one person. The movie starts with Pat Metheny talking about you, John, um, saying... He's not thinking about any of the nuts and bolts. He's thinking about just communicating ideas. What was your reaction to that when you saw that clip from Pat? Well, I think that's, uh, in a way, the nature of the music. You know, it's collaborative. And, um, and uh, 
Yeah, you know, when you play this kind of music with other people where you are partially making it up, it's not, you know, improvisation. It might be uh, uh, a little misleading for people to think that it's all completely off the cuff. But yeah, you do it with other people. And then you play your thing, you listen to what they play, and then you play something that that works along with it. And it's just like in a conversation that you and I are having now, we adapt whether we know it or not to the situation. And that, and that, and so that was a big compliment that Pat paid me, I think, because I know he's a, a he likes the, the jazz uh, idea, you know, and uh, that's what he is going for. And he knows I like it too. Yeah. And then, and then you follow that up, Jörg, with a with a quote from Miles Davis, who you played with, John, talking about it's it's not uh, the notes you play; it's the notes that you don't play. I mean, that seems fundamental in a way. I mean, you put it at the top of the film, so those two things together, Pat talking about the exchange of ideas and and combined with the Miles quote of what you don't play, seems to set the stage for the whole for the whole film. I was a huge Miles fan and had all his records and stuff before I ever played with him. I had tried to learn how, how to play solos that reflected the way Miles played the trumpet, you know? You know, the space in between the phrases is really important for emphasis or de-emphasis or whatever. And if we all talked all the time without any space, it would be completely numbing to the listener. So these little spaces, in between phrases, uh, make it breathe. It's also natural. And yeah, Miles was really uh, uh, talked about that a lot, you know, because when musicians learn to play, they're practicing on their own and they're just playing as fast as they can with nonstop in order to master their instruments. And we have to sort of unlearn that. You're constantly adjusting to what's happening. I really felt the freeform uh, arrangement of the scenes as being very uh, mirroring to a, a jazz song in a way. It was very natural, it was very pure. There wasn't a heavy angle on it in terms of like trying to say something heavily. And, and I just love the way the music works throughout the film. The reason for music is being, you know, created by the performance of the scene, but also just sort of within um, the natural flow of, of life on the road for a, a jazz guitar master. I had no idea uh, what this would be like. And, and you can really see your uh, craftsmanship and art putting this together and making a uh, this little piece and and i i uh i love that he's he's so uh talented at 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 taking this seemingly nothing you know i mean he was just there and then he pulled all this stuff out of the air and 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 made this film this is really the center of the village here where the gaslight was where dylan first started and cafe a go-go was down on bleaker street all the places i used to go as a kid Mamoon's falafels is still there. It was really just sort of capturing the place and time and, and you, John, on on the road, really, and, and getting a little insight of your life at home here in Katona. But I love that it was, it felt very hands-off in a way. There was a, a real naturalness to it. I love being home, uh, and I miss it when I'm gone. But I also am so happy when I get out on the road and play. Let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, life on the road as a musician, like your uh, your entire career has been on the road, right? I mean, you first of all, would you say there's a part of the film when you when you make the statement that you've been releasing an album every year since your first album, which was remind me, 1970, 77, yeah, 77. That that's that's a staggering amount of productivity and and output. Um, yeah. 
but you've been you've been touring all the time right uh, yeah and, until and, the pandemic which happens in the movie too but it, i wonder what it would be like without it i don't know the movie really is as much about life on the road as 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 anything else you know and mentioning yeah. you know wives needing to be accommodating and and i mean your whole life kind of gets organized around being on the road and and i think you know captures that but just talk a little bit about that yeah i've been on the road i'm usually about half the year i would be traveling and uh part of that i mean i think in order to play any kind of creative music you can't stay home in other words you know, you can, no matter who it is who's doing uh, uh, niche music like this, you know, it's not like being a session man or, or a studio musician or backing up other people. You've got this kind of music and there is a sm smallish audience for it. And if you stay home and do it, you might get some place in New York City to uh, let you play, you know, every Monday night. But pretty soon you become a local group and then attendance diminishes i don't care who it is and uh so you have to go out on the road and and there are you know people in in all the cities smaller cities who want to hear you if you show up there every three years or something so there's this network of uh of of musical clubs and venues and and concert halls and promoters who love the music all over the world and uh I feel like I've been lucky enough to 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 uh, tap into that scene and and work and and people a lot of times say well how how can you do that you know to travel is so, so exhausting and all and I think it's sort of how can you not do it if if you've spent your life trying to learn how to to play this music and then uh you know, because <laughs> I'll tell you, if I just sat home, I, I have nothing else. I, I don't know. You know, I'm walking the dog, Brian. I'm out there with you. And uh, and I like it. Actually, I love it. And I'm probably going to start touring less, you know, as as I'm older and and uh, and all. But for many years from like the mid 70s until uh, the uh, the covid lockdown, I was on the road half the year all the time. And uh I'm lucky that my family put up with it, but it's it's been a wonderful life. It's not like the Rolling Stones, you know, or some group who goes in the studio and writes these songs. And that's amazing, too. You know, you write the music and then you perform it and you make this beautiful record and you mix it and take forever to do it. And that's your art. And I, I love that idea. What we do is just... Uh, we play every night and it's always a little bit different and you, and you get better at it. You know, uh, it's, it's really technical music and, and in order to, to be good at it as a group and be good at it on your instrument, you have to uh, do it a lot. So yeah, <laughs> on the road. Yeah. And then, uh, Yerg, was there, um, there's a scene where the luggage gets lost and, uh, and you realize like, oh, this could be a problem in getting to the next gig, potentially. You realize that there's a there's a stakes involved of actually having to get from point A to point B to, to play the yeah. gig. Were you, were you mindful of that, Yerg, as you were filming? Like, oh, there could be a problem getting to the next gig. Yeah, I mean, that, that was like a perfect occasion for me to film, actually. People want to see how other people react to, to things that are not foreseeable. Um, and they want to be involved in finding a solution to a problem. Uh-oh. Vicente's bag is missing. Yeah. And I remember one time that happened with my guitar. It's not just about communicating ideas, but also about um, communicating issues sometimes and to be part of an ongoing process of of um, of solving problems is is like a very lucky circumstance for a documentary filmmaker <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah. I love it. <laughs> is that new or you've had that a while? You know, this is crazy. In the movie, I play one of these guitars in the uh, guitar shop scene in Seattle. So then, Man, like two right, months right. later, I got in touch with the guitar shop and bought that guitar. And this is this is the guitar that was in the movie. Yeah. This, this is, is the one from Seattle. I went and I bought it. <laughs> like two months after we got back or six months, I, I got in touch with the guitar store and and bought that guitar. There's a little bit of um, nostalgia for the old days. There was a great jazz club right in here called Boomers. I used to go to in the 70s. All the greats of jazz used to play there. Now it's trendy shops. You know, when I first started to go to jazz clubs, uh, there were more of them. I remember, you know, really when I started out in the 70s. Um, you know, I remember in Philadelphia and and uh, and in Boston there were numerous ones, and of course New York City. And but also I heard about uh, how there were even more, uh, you know, in the 60s and in the 50s. And uh, this whole jazz club thing, uh, older musicians would tell me about uh, leaving New York and going on the road, and they'd play like two weeks at a time across the country. But they would play for two weeks and they would play from nine to two in the morning. Uh, and then maybe it wasn't that expensive, but that was a, a, a life for these groups. Uh, and that's the great, you know, classic jazz groups like John Coltrane Quartet and the Bill Evans Trio and Miles Davis Quintet. And, and, uh, and that has slowly changed, you know. And, uh, and now it's New York is the only town that really has a lot of jazz clubs you know there's still like eight or something in new york and uh, you know there's something about a jazz club as versus to uh, a, a larger venue that really suits the music and there's something also about when uh, it doesn't happen as much when groups play two sets or three sets they used to play more than that you're just playing more so you get better the musicians get better. And when you play all the time, you just get more uh, agility as a band and as a, as a player. And that's why I think jazz in the 50s and 60s was so great. Um, so, yeah, part of that's my own nostalgia from seeing it change, but also knowing about the history of the music. How does it feel now? Do you feel like now you're the old guard and you're telling the, the young up-and-comers? How does it feel yeah. in the jazz landscape now for you? Well, because I'm 71 now, I'm sort of a relic, aren't I? But um, I don't feel like that, but I think I am. Um, uh, and, and you know, I do notice... Um, that I'll that I'll talk to younger musicians and they've got a completely different perspective. But the great thing about musicians is if somebody can be 25 and if they're really good and we're playing together, we're just playing together. There's no age gap when you're performing and play and, and you meet like minded musicians. So that's interesting, you know, but then, uh, you know, I remember talking to the older musicians and I would say, oh, my God, you heard uh coltrane alive and and uh and charlie parker and i couldn't believe I, I wish i had heard those guys and now i'm like that and i tell oh yeah i heard various groups you know and they're like oh, what you know? <laughs> uh eric when you were on the road um did you have any intentions of what you were trying to capture uh or uh was it generally just you know be there and see what happens. Well, I, I had a few ideas, but that's all you can have uh, when you're making a documentary. Um, you can't really, you can't really script anything. In that way, documentary filmmaking is kind of, kind of related to jazz and improvisation. And 
things can happen and, and will happen that you don't expect. Like the birth of Vicente's child, for instance. This is the first time that we've ever had a band member have a birth during the sound check. <laughs> <laughs> no, everybody says to me, I can't believe that 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 happened and that you got that on film, you know, yeah, because well, I, I he was FaceTiming with his wife in the hospital bed with the newborn baby in Oregon. And uh, yeah, people can't believe, oh, how come he wasn't home during the the birth and, and that nobody understands that yeah, when you have this group and you have to go on the road and you have these dates. One of the things that struck me is about the film is that, I, I, you know, I don't think you have to be a jazz uh, expert or aficionado or super fan to enjoy this film. There is something about jazz that I think um, for people who have not gotten into jazz at all, um, that there may be a feeling of it being opaque or uh just kind of hard to get your head around or uh elite or esoteric or so you know something non-accessible and this film could be a great entry point for someone who's never gotten into jazz before i'm i'm also a product of rock and roll you know as well as jazz and this whole thing happened in the 70s where uh things from rock and roll like especially guitar things and rhythms and and entered uh the, the jazz world and and uh a lot of jazz purists didn't like it and uh um sometimes absolutely for good reason too um but uh you know so i think uh that that um that now there's other kinds of jazz that exist uh, outside of my frame of reference too. You know, people the, the human thing is to just keep it keep it going and and adapt it. And and it, jazz is a weird word. Maybe it's not even appropriate, or any appro word for any kind of music is appropriate. I don't know, but um, uh, that's what that's that's wh why music is valid because human beings take it and they take from the past and they apply their own uh, situation to it and it's a little different and it's art, you know. I get inspiration from great music, from art of any kind. You know, when you say, "Well, oh, a person made that," you know, I want to make something too. You know, but at the same time, isn't it interesting to to hear music and see films and uh, read books that are, are coming from uh, a place of, of real meaning for the creator, you know, and that translates excitement to me. And that's what Jörg did with his film, because uh, I think it's important uh, to say that, uh, you know, that this is not just a, a concert footage of the John Schofield band or anything. This is Jurg's uh, real peek into to something and and he's he's crafted this this piece about me and these people and and about what he saw and and it becomes this whole other thing that uh, that I love. and that's what uh, the people, my friends that have seen the movie, say you know they, that uh, well we you know we knew about your music but this film just on its own is is this cool uh uh piece of work and so i think it fits perfectly with the music jurg's uh creation <laughs> All right. Well, thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. I'm going to watch your film. I'm looking forward to seeing the other one. I'm yeah. going to go walk the dog right now, Brian. So okay, you'll see, see me. You'll see me working over here. Bye. Bye. I like. You probably that. listen to. You probably listen to records too, right? LPs. LPs. Oh. Yeah, I don't know.